An effort must now be made to learn the truth concerning the greatest and most consoling, yet also the most formidable of the minor arcana, concerning death. It expresses in the divine world the perpetual movement of creation, destruction and renewal. An illumination entered me and, looking at the receding rider and the descending sun, I understood that the path of life consists of the steps of the horse of death. The sign of the thirteenth arcanum is Mem. Its numerical value is 40. There is no astrological correspondence. The hieroglyph of the arcanum is the figure of a woman as a mediator in the transformation of the plan of life. For a woman, a fetus makes the transition from uterine life to life in the Earth's atmosphere. The picture of the arcanum gives us the figure of death in the form of a traditional skeleton with a scythe. It emphasises the importance of death as the transformer of the one life in the field of the diversity of its forms. The skeleton mows crowned and uncrowned heads, but under its scythe new arms and legs grow out of the ground. Death only seems to pay off something in a certain plane. In fact, it only transforms the values of this plane. It cannot be put in analogy with the process of burning credit papers without issuing new ones. Rather, it could be likened to the process of smelting some coins into others. In the picture of the 13th Arcanum, death is depicted unilaterally partially, but certainly analytically, completed. I draw your attention to two more details in this assembled picture. Death is depicted as an operating skeleton. But what is a skeleton from a symbolic point of view? This is what we consider the most coagulated and least changeable in our body. It is, so to speak, the derivative of the body in its hardness. This is what the other elements of the body build on. Therefore, the principle of death is inextricably linked with the beginning of the so-called strong coagulation. And moreover, it is connected by a chain of causality. We died in a past time because we must coagulate. And this conclusion is an immutable truth of a mathematical nature. This truth is under the auspices of Saturn, like all the inexorably logical consequences of the chosen premise. That is why the skeleton with a scythe appears on the mascots of Saturn. That is why in everyday life, the skull and crossbones are so eagerly chosen by us as the hieroglyph of the motto, Memento Mori. The need to decompose our bodies in a, is a mocking way reminds us of exactly what in other people's bodies does not have time to decompose, but which is undoubtedly also condemned to decomposition and weathering. A completed picture of death would turn into a picture of a new life, and an unfinished picture emphasises the transition we call death. Crisscrossed bones, this gloomy quaternary, serves as the last challenge of coagulating gnomes to a thinning salamander, the last threat to constrain the astrosome with a physical body through the destruction of the latter, which is mandatory for the phantom connecting them. The bone shouts to the personality. You had a reference point, and thanks to you, and thanks to it, you operated magically. So now, in punishment, 
be connected with this reference point until you give the elements coagulated by you to nature. You will not have complete freedom of the astral life. You will have a little earthly caring. You will not instantly move from a three-pronged life to a two-pronged life. You will know the transitional stage and give it the name death. This is what the picture says. It will not be harmful to think about it. When analysing the arcanum, we will try to take all these points into consideration and begin with a simple description of the process of death of a human individual as it is understood in everyday life. Let's take as an example the body of an individual person that has become incapable of maintaining the vital functions of the physical plane, either because of his own will, suicide, or by the will of another pentagram, violent death, murder. Or for mixed reasons, laws of nature, collisions with other people's volitional impulses, one's own negligence, his own legal impulses, leading to an increase of the expenditure of vitality, etc., has become unsuitable for fulfilling the vital functions of the physical plane. The astrosome fights against the failure of physical functions, clings to the slightest pretexts for to prolong the life of the body as a whole in the physical plane, agony, but in the end is forced to leave the body as an unsuitable mechanism and to begin a new two-planed activity called the gap between incarnations. The passage to the other plane consists contains several phases. In this elementary course, we will not delve into the theoretical and practical meaning that each one of these stages possesses for an initiate who naturally wishes both to prepare himself for death, how to facilitate this passage to their fellow men by a specific magical act. These subjects belong to a specific course of magic and for the most part they cannot be revealed in our present course. We would just like to answer three possible questions. What means do we have to study the death process? What should be in general a good preparation of oneself for the passage to the other plane? What are the means of helping people who are dying? If we understand this expression, according to the initiatory teachings. Let us begin by answering the first question. First of all, we have the testimony of sensitive people by nature, or whose sensitivity was artificially stimulated by suggestion or self-suggestion, so that they could observe by the sixth sense of the death process. We also have the law of analogy, which we allow by studying a less subtle process and therefore more accessible to the organs of the physical senses, that is, i.e. the passage from the fetus of intrauterine life to the life of a child in the world, to establish the analogies in the two processes. Studying these analogies makes it easier to formulate the questions that one puts to the sensitive or the sensitive himself to himself. It is important not only to observe the process of death, but also to know what to focus our attention on, that which to keep in memory and what differentiations, differentiations to establish. In addition to these resources, we have Kabbalistic methods of a priory study with the help of the alphabet, which in turn leads us to ask certain questions and to differentiate several unobserved death processes. Subjects tuned for sensitivity indicate that the process of death, strictly speaking, from the occult's point of view, begins at the very moment when doctors say that the subject is dead. The cessation of the heartbeat and the beginning of the cooling of the body coincide with the first phase of the final exteriorization of the astrosome. First, the senses can see the astral branch of the limbs, mainly lower. Then comes the separation of the astral elements that control the parts of the body. Finally, the exteriorization of the head parts of the astrosome begins. 
The observe, observer notes the separation of the astral figure, its removal from the body, with which it remains connected by, as if by an umbilical cord, the, re, the entry point of which is the so-called so Brahma's hole at the back of the head. Following the umbilical cord, what can be called the astral body slowly emerges. If we adhere to obstetric terminology, which is fully justified by the above reference to the law of analogy of the process of death with the process of birth in terms of atmospheric perception. The entire process of childbirth in the astral continues on average for an adult about 48 hours. But during this time, and the next 10 to 40 days, the dying person has to adapt to a lot and experience multiphase impressions. At first, that is, in the period immediately following the agony, the deceased experiences the difficulty of separating his astral. These difficulties are all the greater the less he learned during his incarnation to separate, through meditation, his inner self from the envelope that contained it. The suffering experienced by him in this phase is in the nature of a difficult parting with what he used to consider his most essential reality. During the mentioned period, the complicated edifice of illusions that were dear to him collapses. When there is familiarity with this collapse and acceptance of the inevitability of the passage into the world of new experiences, the deceased begins to feel the discomfort of this change. First of all, you have to face the astral forms of the elementals. Here comes the division of activity of the astral zone, the activity of the Ruesh, the soul, and the activity of the Nefesh, the ghost. The latter has as its task the return of components of the old physical body to the elements of nature, or, in other words, the task of progressive deconstruction of this body. The Ruash should analyse the clichés created, both by received elements, the negative, as well as by active poles, the positive element, of the personality during the newly completed incarnation. When this analysis is completed, the soul, Ruash, goes on to study the clichés of planetary currents which could, in future incarnations, correct the mistakes of their past incarnations and contribute to the formation of one more perfect. As we can see, the tasks of the ghost, Nefesh, and the soul, Ruash, form a binary which must be neutralised through meditation in the bipolar field of the astral world. In the first times, this meditation is greatly hampered by the astral environment itself. When the elemental, the deceased, frees himself from the nefesh and goes beyond the layer of elemental forms which now seem very ugly to him and only evoke in him the composition of his old body and his slavery to the elements, enters the sphere where the lower elementals, animals, plants, minerals, united in egregorical currents, work on perfecting their future physical organs. For them, hastened to be able to incarnate again, this work is very important. The human elemental must prepare to pass quickly through this region, for it can learn only how to perfect the organs of the physical senses of the future incarnation. This for him is not the main thing. The main task is one's hermetic improvement. At first sight, this does not seem to be a difficult task, because the Ruash, separating from the Nefesh, purified his ability of objective self-criticism. However, the Ruash must now pass through the vortex of temptations, the vortex of darkness, 
and has to face the involutive flow of the earth astral. It is a chain that serves the involutive purposes of the planet and that has, as a point of support, the very body of the earth. The Ruash, who has just lost his pentagrammatic foothold, the physical body, must now face the involutive current of the earth itself. It may be objected that the Ruash, being of the highest essence, should prevail, and that the encounter with the terrestrial involutionary flow could not harm it. This is truth about a highly evolved pentagram, but if it is a being that has not time, the field of desires and your receptivity, in cases where the astral level does not progress beyond that of the planet, that flow will avenge itself cruelly of the participation of the deceased in the evolutionary activities. It is as if the planets told him, as a link of the great evolutionary comfort of the men of the earth, current of the men of the earth, you fought with me, but as an individual you were not always pure and faithful professed ideals, and sometimes you took advantage of the solidarity of the chain to promote your selfish ends. Now, therefore, that you are in the field of my influence, and without support on the physical plane, you will be subject to the law of the attraction of the like. By the lower desires that still exist in you, you will be drawn to the vortex where they are condensed. You will be defiled so that you become my temporary ally in involutive work. Perhaps these desires will lead you to create for yourself a new ghost, worse than the previous one. Perhaps you will abandon your aspirations to the higher spheres. Maybe you will give in to temptation and you will join my school where you will learn new ways to perform selfish enjoyments. I hope you will conclude a pact with me and incarnate to promote my involutive purposes. Unhappy is the one who does not know how to overcome the temptation of the great serpent of the planet. He will incarnate but to serve involution. If on the contrary, the human elemental wins the proof of the involutive flow, then Ascertaining in the astral his abilities, he could become a worthy student of that world university in which they draw up the plans for redemptive work and the ascension to the absolute truth. These are the experiences the dying and the dead go through in a relatively short time. Soon the question might arise if all this data was captured exclusively through the sixth sense. No, this means would not be sufficient to state the above. This research is helped greatly by Kabbalah, which allows us to penetrate the mysteries of the beyond when we know how to apply its methods. In this course, we cannot go into the study of the so-called pneumatics, which addresses these issues. We can say, however, that a wise cabalization of the book Sefer Yetzera and the in-depth study of Sohar's extensive original commentary gives us much insight into the subject of death. In addition to the aforementioned means of knowledge, there is another of which we shall speak in later chapters and which are our own frequent exteriorizations in the middle astral plane. The way into the experiences during such externalizations differ only in details of the common process of death. Let us now turn to the second question. How can a supporter of esotericism prepare for death? First, you must not forget that it is inevitable. You should not close your eyes to the continuous spectacle, spectacle of the impermanence of life. In Freemasonry, a Mason receives the recommendation to remember death. If we look for the whole human incarnation as a preparation for death, we will understand the importance of this initiatory training, which, whilst not having a practical use in the three-dimensional world, is an important preparation for the existence of two planes in the world. 
to arrive through meditation to differentiate what constitutes the true human being from that which is only its physical envelope is the ABC of preparation for death and existence in the astral. Since it allows us to know that real human life takes place in the astral and not in the plane of what is physical enclosure. By the word to know, we do not have in mind only a simple intellectual admission of life in the astral, nor a logical conviction of the independence of our inner self from its physical enclosure. We have in mind something else, the constant awareness of the difference between the body and the internal. The latter can manifest itself strongly even in a weak and suffering body. One's own weakness and suffering can even increase awareness of the diversity between the two. Physical weakness is an impediment only in the field of achievement, but never in the field of ethics or self-knowledge. The true homeland of the human being are those currents of planetary systems to which it aspires, and never the environment in which the physical body is. The soul does not feel at home inside the body, by its very nature it is foreign to the coagulates which imperfectly correspond to the most perfect forms of the astrozone. These, though subtle, are much more durable and intense in their manifestations. In life, one has to get accustomed to giving preference to the more subtle states, for example, liquid to dense, to the gaseous rather than the liquid, to the radiant rather than the gaseous. We must learn to feel that the intrinsic form, the internal structure, we are more like the dense matter that surrounds and fills this form. Having become, more, become accustomed to meditate on these subjects and helped by the reading of the classic works with regard to Kabbalah and magic and mental exchange with people who work in it since, we can begin a systematic preparation for the process of externalization of our astrosome. All exercises that lead to overcoming the normal reactions of one or another organ, one or another group of organs, or overcoming the normal exchange between body and external nature are preparation for further exteriorization. For example, such training includes breathing retention, heartbeat, numbness of any part of the body, sleep, or on the contrary, to fall asleep at will, to hear without seeing or feeling tactile impressions, of receiving only visual perceptions, being insensitive to acoustic, of perceiving by the sense organ only contains certain colours or certain sounds, to hear exclusively the voice of a certain person, to see only objects of a certain shape or colour, etc. The role of such exercises will perhaps be more understandable if we add that externalisation, voluntary or involuntary, in general, occurs only in states of lethargy or catharsis. Naturally, provoking yourself or another person, a state of cathepsis by will, effort or by narcotics is insufficient to reach the exteriorization of the astrozone. For exteriorization, not the external influences, but the will and the capacity of the person himself to leave the body, that is, of already knowing his inner self and having learned to separate it from all the elements belonging to the physical plane, are decisive. At the moment of exteriorization, a simple thought about an object of everyday use, reminiscent of a flavour or a perfume, the awareness of the physical well-being, etc., can easily compromise their success. In any case, we will indicate a scheme of exercises that can lead to astral output, considering it as the best method to become familiar with death and to know the first phase of its process and sometimes also its more advanced phases. <clears throat> and then he describes, Meebs that is, describes quite a lot of exercises, which I'm not gonna share completely.
Those who have learned to externalize and who, after having returned to their body, translate the language of vis visual perceptions, the impressions received during the exteriorization, affirm having seen the umbilical cord uniting them to the body, entering this body not by the Brahma, as in the case of death, but in the vicinity of the solar plexus. In detail, they describe the thickness of this cord. We deduce that the thickness greatly increases the higher is the astral subplane reached in exteriorization. A trained and attentive person, after noticing the position of his body and umbilical cord during ex externalization, will notice the presence of the astrosomes of objects surrounding his body and then of the elementals, whose shapes he found ugly and strange. This is the opinion of the Ruash element, observing the coarse and imperfect element of Nefesh. Then contact is established with the subplane of the elementals of the animals that work, as has already been said, in the improvement of their organs for future incarnations. This sphere no longer causes revulsion, but it does not attract either. We must understand that the perfection of the physical organ does not aim at astral harmony, but its use in the physical world. Therefore, this region cannot attract the astrosome and is already superior to the physical plane. Next, we encounter the powerful involutionary flux of the Earth's astrosome. To the person who is seriously prepared for the externalization, the fight with this change should not be very difficult. It is common, however, that someone has only partially overcome several aspects of our egoism. Often a child of the earth, although it has already become aware of its true nature, has not yet given up all the temptations of earthly life. Sometimes it's harder to break the attraction, even knowing how illusory its object is. The one who fails to meet the snake on the planet is left behind in the dark cone where are perceived their weaknesses one by one with awareness of our inability to overcome them totally. This experience is very depressing and causes, after the exteriorization and for a long time, a fading of faith in the self. This can be expressed in misanthropy and melancholia, which may sometimes give way to malevolence and may even lead to the desire to offer oneself consciously at the service of involution. In the latter case, it is often said that the person concluded a pact with the dark cone. If on the contrary, the person beats the astral serpent, it reaches the middle astral of our solar system. Here we study all the planetary fluxes and their various combinations. There occurs also the clear understanding of the harmony that must be realised within our being. What we are missing for this realisation, what is unilateral to us, and what we totally lack. Then begins the planning of the conditions that, on the physical plane, will facilitate the future harmonisation. As far as our possibilities of knowing during the life the astral plane, and of learning more about post-mortem experiences. The Rosicrucian School teaches that an adept who sincerely and unselfishly strives to unveil these mysteries can reach in his or her astral initiation the threshold of the second death. What is the second death? To understand it we need to analyse the human structure. Man is a being on three planes. According to the law of reflexes, each plane has its reflection. We could say your representative in the other two planes, therefore, the human being is composed of nine elements. On the mental plane, the mental element in its own mental plane, reflection of the astral element in the mental plane, and reflection of the physical element on the mental plane. The astral plane. The reflection of the mental in the astral plane, the astral element in its own plane, 
and reflection of the physical on the astral plane. Physical plane. Reflection of the mental on the physical plane. Reflection of the astral in the physical plane. Physical element in its own plane. This scheme allows for a priori logical analysis. However, in practice, even logic, we are not able to discern all nine elements. The imperfection of the sixth sense makes it difficult to discern between, for example, the reflection of the physical element in the astral and that of the astral in the physical. In the same way, it is difficult for us to separate the reflection from the physical and the mental and the reflection of the mental and the physical. The last difficulty is probably due to the imperfection of our mental health functions. Thus, a trained adept discerns in the human being only seven elements. Mental in the mind, astral in the mental, connection of the physical with the mental, mental in the astral, astral in the astral, connection of the physical with the astral, and the physical itself. In an embodied person, you must imagine these seven elements as interconnected. When the seventh element is worn out and is not able to serve as a reference point for the higher elements, the first death we are studying occurs. This is the breaking of our chain on the sixth element. <clears throat> the seventh element, <clears throat> excuse me, the seventh element turns into a corpse, and the sixth, no longer serving as a link, becomes its phantom. The higher five elements study in the astral plane, and again produce the sixth and seventh elements, that is, reincarnate, die the first death again, etc., until the five human elements become so harmonious as to cease to obey the attraction of the funnels we mentioned. This is like any androgynous one, and therefore does not lend itself to the downward attraction. For such an elementary element, the astral life is no longer reduced to the planning of the future physical, but to the refinement of the fifth element by influencing the fourth. But making forms the fifth element more and more ideological, the fourth element, we will eventually bring them to a state that excludes the possibility of particularities of formal transitions to the physical. In the company of two thin fourth and fifth elements, the third element cannot live. Once the elementary has ceased to prepare for physical life, the third element begins to erode in it. Having weathered, he naturally leads the elementary to a second death. The fifth element will be the corpse in the process of the second death, and the fourth element will be its phantom. To clearly imagine this process, draw an analogy of it in art history, where in some cases the corpse is a harmonic style and its phantom is the guiding idea of this style. complicated. <laughs> I'll just show you, talk about elements. This is the list at the bottom of the page. The new, almost one-sided essence of the composition, the mental and the mental plus astral in the astral, will be the pole of the future androgynous cell of the reintegrated Adam protoplast. I say the pole of the cell and not the cell, because in order to make up the androgynous cell, our essence must wait for the second death of the sister soul if the combination of these two polarities did not happen in the astral plane, which is the most common case. Many do not even allow the possibility of a single second death of a male or female soul. Indeed, the representation of the harmonic state of the fifth element is difficult to logically combine with the same sex state of mind. 
astral in the astral, fifth element. In this arcanum, we speak only of perception on the astral plane, that is, of the receptivity during the externalizations, of the achievements, that is, of the activity during the externalizations. We will speak in the fourteenth, the fifteenth arcanum, which is the devil. It would be wrong to think that a good preparation for death consists in the practice of externalizations. It is more important that the person knows or believes deeply that certain experiences wait after death on the way to a new existence. A deep faith can replace the experience. Bringing in knowledge with the region of the elementals, we discover our past bondage to the elements. Knowledge of the region of organic improvement of animals and plants gives us the understanding of our future enslavement to the same elements during the next incarnations. The struggle with the serpent is reduced to the consciousness of the need to break away sooner or later from the egoism dictated to us by the conditions of life on the planets. And contemplation of the cliché of the middle astral will come down to the recognition of the need for harmonious self-improvement. He who believes this not in words but in the depths of his heart, he will always be able during the course of his earthly life to establish a strong connection with one of the powerful evolutionary egregores who will direct him through all the estates, the strata, and pull him out of the arms of the serpent. Believing and praying is a great help in preparing for dying. Now he's going to speak about how a man possessing faith and knowledge can relieve others of the painful experiences of death. Help is given in three ways, teaching, preparing and sustaining. If anyone has unlimited trust in us, then it will not be difficult to tell him what we are studying if this person meditates at length on what is reported. It will considerably facilitate guidance in the experiences of the hour of death. Possessing competence and time and consecrating it to the methodical development of the intuition of our inner sensitivity and ability to feel an individuality immortal, we will certainly have done for this our brother more than in the previous case, since we will have to discover for ourselves a part of what we are studying. Suppose we wish to help in the passage to the other world, someone who we were able to prepare in advance. We will then have the right and the duty, due to fraternal solidarity of all the cells of Adam Protoplasta, to help our brother, be it through magical acting on the body if we possess the necessary knowledge in order to sustain the activity of the astrosome or by the theurgical performance asking that the light of truth be let before him. The details of these procedures are part of a special magic course but here you can be given a brief general outline of the method of providing the aid referred to. Let us not forget to have the process of death from the hidden point of view, its beginning when medicine declares the person has passed away. In order not to hinder and delay the process from birth to body, it should not be touched, pulled, disturbed or manipulated in any way, some for at least six hours after the death. In addition, it should be people whose fluids in the life of the deceased have not been sympathetic to him, since this could hamper the work of your astrosome. Do not talk about the body close to the body, to real problems, since the conversations could be captured not only by the sixth sense of the dead, but also by the subtle counterpart of his physical organs, his ghost. During the second period, also of at least six hours, 
often more, the person who has set out to help the deceased should imagine himself accompanying him on the journey he is obliged to do for the other plane, but for which he needs an affectionate goodbye, and they who have still a foothold in the physical. The dead, who now understands his past dependence on the elementals, will be comforted knowing and feeling that one, his brother, acting magically, rests on the same plane of elementals to free him more quickly from that sphere. During the latter period, and up to 40 days after death, we would advise, due to the limitations of this course, there is only one thing, to pray for the dead. Avoid despair and distress. Even worse and almost criminal would we to give up lamentations over the material damage done to us by the death of our neighbour. This could harm the fight with the serpent. In prayer and in magical acting, one must carefully tune in with the evolutionary ukagores, which the dead felt in affinity. When speaking of death as of the process of diminishing the number of planes that make up the being, it is also necessary to devote a few words to the reverse process, increasing the number of these planes, that is, the process known as the incarnation of an elemental. Suppose that the elemental has ended its stay in the middle astral of the solar system, or even just in the dark cone, that's the individualised currents of the biplane beings that govern evolution and which we call spiritus directus or archons, have already completed the redemptive experiences aimed at this elementary. In other words, its attraction for the lower astral is no longer mitigated by the study in the middle astral than it would be necessary for the next incarnation. He falls into the whirlwinds of the lower astral and, according to one who has learned and decided, is attracted and absorbed by a certain swell funnel formed by the magic operation of coitus of their future land parents. Attraction is created by astral elements of the parents and by the zodiacal characteristics of their physical bodies. The choice of planetary influence is important so that the new human being can maintain during incarnation the direction chosen by him at the time of his study in the middle astral. The zodiacal choice is important in determining the physical attributes, good or precarious, of the future body. This is according to karma of the determinate elemental. Attracted by the funnel, the elemental form, definitely his nephesh, which in general lines has already been delineated in the astral. The ease of forming the nephesh is conditioned by the already mentioned affinities with their future parents. In its turn, the formation of the physical body, that is, the work of the nephesh, is facilitated by the intrauterine life of the fetus, during which the struggle with adverse influences is limited to the minimum due to the mother's astrosome energetic protection and the physical protection of her body which supplies the fetus with appropriate elements. The moment of birth, that is the beginning of conflict with external influences, is very important for the human being because the fact that the total and experience of the newborn makes it, even for an instant, entirely receptive to planetary influences and zodiacal flows, which are more repelled by the astrosome of the mother. This is why astrology gives the moment a primordial importance. After this analysis of the process of the death of a human being, we will move to the titles of the Arcanum. The first title in common parlance is the Scythe, in more erudite language, the death. We have already observed that the idea of death, even in the presentation of the blade, is linked to the idea of rebirth. In relation to the archetype, this arcanum tells us that the archetype triangle of Fabre d'Olive corresponds to the present, it never dies, because it is continually reborn in its essence. Hence comes the title, Immortalitas in Essentia, or Permanentia in Essentia. 
immortality in essence or permanence in essence. The adaption of the arcanum to the field of man had already led us to the detailed analysis of the title Amor et Reincarnatio. As for nature, in her is always reborn, in a new form, everything that has disappeared. What will this principle of constant rebirth, which despite the numerous transformation of forms, guards the collective value of your closed system be? This principle is energy. The third title of the arcanum will therefore be Transmutatio Energiae, or in Helmholtz's terminology, Transmutatio Virium. It's interesting to notice that in the beginning the preservation of energy was formulated for the first time by a man whose profession obliged him to study the phase of illness and death, Dr. Mayer. He's now going to do an arithmetic analysis of the arcane and let me just see if we can No, I'm not going to do this because I think there's been enough. When we come to the notes, apart from this, there's a lot about the meaning of the number 13. But we also, um, our attention is drawn to the fact that in meditations on the tarot, Tom Berg draws a clear analogy between sleeping, forgetting and death, contrasting with the opposite state whereby one remembers, awakens and is born. It is not just the mind which forgets or remembers, but the soul and will may also participate. Just as there is a physical death, there may also be a psychic or a moral death. Whilst forgetting is an aspect of death, remembrance is a magical operation of living which enables us to evoke an image or essence from the past. The ability of the higher self to engage a revelatory memory is largely dependent upon the discipline of the lower self in its fealty to the spiritual vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. The moment when Jesus recalls Lazarus to life is presented as an ultimate act of divine remembrance. Thus is absolute recall analogous to resurrection. We might be said to forget the gravitational pull from below when we are recalled to reunion with God in heaven above. This is a quote. It is through the mastery over forgetfulness, sleep and death, that one arrives in the past, that one arrives today, and that one will arrive in the future, at the mystical experience of the soul united with God, and therefore at the absolute certainty of immortality. Herein is a glimpse inside the mystery of the mother letter Mem, which along with Aleph and Shin, contains an eon of divine teaching theurgical and psychological, astral and emotional, physical, mental, and a word for the soul to digest. 